Thank you all for coming uh, this evening uh, to discuss uh, a very unpleasant chapter in the history uh, of Palestine, uh, a very difficult uh, historical chapter that continues until today. And uh, hopefully, with some insights about how to have a better future for all of us who live there, Arabs and Jews uh, alike. I would like to uh, start by the way I start the book and talk about a certain building that does not exist anymore in the city of Tel Aviv, which was called at the time the Red Building. Uh, this building that uh, is now uh, uh, an American hotel in Tel Aviv, a Sheraton Hotel, used to be the headquarters of the Jewish underground in the mandatory period, in fact, in the late mandatory period. Britain, uh, the mandatory period in Palestine was between 1918 and 1948, uh, when Britain ruled Palestine. And this particular building, uh, in the last three years of the British mandate, between 1945 to 1948, hosted the headquarters of the main Jewish underground, called in Hebrew the Haganah, literally meaning defense. Um, it was called the Red Building because uh, it was uh, previously, before it turned into a headquarter, uh, of a military organization, it was the headquarter of the Jewish trade union movement in uh, Palestine, which uh, saw itself as part of the international socialist organizations. And the Red House was meant to represent the socialist uh, color, if you want, of that very particular building. Some people who are survivors from the period even claim that at least one part of the house was painted in red, which is another explanation why the house was called the Red House. Now, this building must have been a very beautiful one because we have the pictures from that building. As I say, unfortunately, we cannot visit the building today as it has become an American uh, hotel. Uh, this building... Uh, in this building, on a cold afternoon, on the 10th of March, 1948, the final plan for the dispossession of the Palestinians from their homeland was devised. We don't have the minutes from that meeting, and it's not surprising. If you look at other cases in history where a group of leaders or politicians contemplated something which they would knew was problematic morally or politically, especially in modern times, when people were aware that there were, would be archives, media, and public interest, people tended not to write down such decisions. And the case of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948 is not different. So we don't have the minutes from that meeting. But we do have the documents that the meeting produced. It was a plan called Plan D, Plan Dalet, that was translated on that day, the 10th of March 1948, into orders, operational orders, to Jewish forces around Palestine to begin implementing a systematic <coughs> dispossession <coughs> of the Palestinians. The way the, uh, I, I, in the book, I, this, I reconstructed that meeting is something you will have to read in the book. I won't elaborate on it now. But it was a kind of a detective work. But basically, I think that Today, in 2006, unlike, let's say, 10 years ago, if I would face an Israeli audience <coughs> and I would say that I've come to the conclusion that on the 10th of March 1948, the Jewish leadership had finally decided to systematically dispossess the Palestinians, 
this very fact by itself would not be objective. Whereas 10 years ago, people would say, no, this is a myth, you have made it up, which is something I will come back to in the end of my talk <coughs> about the present uh, uh, um, atmosphere in Israel. So going back to that date in history, the 10th of March 1948, it's actually a date in which a certain ideological process culminates and matures uh, uh, within the political thought and thinking of the Zionist leadership. I don't want to recap the whole history of the Zionist movement. I hope some of you, maybe all of you, know some of that history, and maybe some of you, all of you, know all of its history. But to make it short, I would say that it would be fair to say that the Zionist movement began in the late 19th century as an attempt to find the Jews in Europe a safe haven from prosecution and anti-Semitism on the one hand, and the second, to allow the Jews to become a nation like so many other ethnic groups in Europe became in the mid 19th century in what was called the Spring of Nations, actually beginning in 1848. So the basic idea emerged in the heart of Europe, in Central Europe in fact, and in Eastern Europe, the Jews were A, facing grave dangers of survivors and existence, and secondly, that Judaism was not just a religion, but was also a national movement. Now, in order to become a nation, and in order to find a safe haven, you need a territory. And it's not surprising that when Zionism began, several territories were offered, not only Palestine, from Argentina, through the United States to Uganda in Africa and finally to Palestine, all kinds of destinations <coughs> were uh, suggested by the small group of Jews in Eastern and Central Europe who thought that they found a solution for what was called then in Europe the Jewish problem. They were not very popular, by the way, amongst the Jews with uh, any of the solution that they offer. For whatever historical reasons, and for whatever ideological reasons, and one should even say for whatever religious reasons, they eventually opted for Palestine. And here, the moral story of Zionism that began as an, a reasonable chapter in the history of a group that was victimized in Europe throughout the centuries, throughout the centuries, becomes a simple story of colonialism. We don't have that many cases, by the way, in history, where such a rapid transformation occurs from a group that is victimized for so many years that in a very brief historical moment becomes, if you want, turns from being colonized to become colonizers. And Again, it doesn't matter what justification people found for this. The historical fact is important. <coughs> the moment Zionism or the Jewish national movement focused on Palestine as the place that would offer the two solutions to the two problems, the danger of Jewish annihilation in Europe on the one hand and the need of the Jews to be a nation like all the other nations on the other, the moment Palestine was chosen as the venue, as the territory for these two uh, solutions, the Zionist project became an ethnic, uh, uh, became a colonialist project. And why did it become a colonialist project? Because Palestine was inhabited by indigenous native <coughs> people. And that particular date I was mentioning, the 10th of March 1948, ended a long process and we should realize it was a long process of Zionist thinking and debating that starts in 1882 when the first Zionist settlers set foot in Palestine.